me the opportunity to say a few words. Um, what I would like to present here is uh, some thoughts and issues on the Lorentz violation, of course, and as I will argue, phenomena of dissipation that always come together, and in particular, what holography might have to say uh, about uh, these things. Uh, since uh, my time is not infinite, I'll be uh, rather brief, and I apologize in advance if some of my comments appear cryptic. Let me start with an introduction which is uh, uh, a historical survey of the issue, of course seen through my own eyes. Um, Lorentz invariance is indeed one of the most important pillars of modern day physics and it uh, remained experimentally unchallenged for more than 100 years. Uh, it has been tested so far to unprecedented accuracy in many cases is at the level of 10 to the minus 21, and in fact recently by the Princeton group in the neutron sector down to 10 to the minus 29. Uh, its reign in fact coincided with the demise of ether as it was already mentioned, and it was Michelson and Morley and Einstein who eventually banished ether in fact as a physical theory. However, it's interesting to point out that uh, few physicists realize that a new kind of ether made it back into physics around 1915 uh, with the general theory of relativity, and this was, in fact, the gravitational field. Um, theories typically rarely question the universal applicability of uh, Lorentz invariance. Uh, I, for me, at least the most prominent idea was Judy Nielsen in the mid-'80s, who sought, in fact, to explain the presence of Lorentz invariance in our world more or less as an emergent infrared symmetry uh, with eventually what I would call inconclusive results. The problem remains open. Uh, there were around the same time related ideas uh, who applied to other low energy symmetries and the term in fact that sort of was given to this whole set of ideas was anti-grand unification for obvious reasons. Uh, Kostelek and Samuel uh, argued that in open string theory, uh, unusual tachyon vacuum expectation values can trigger non-trivial vacuum expectation values for tensor fields and therefore Lorentz violation. However, we know now that this cannot happen, at least we know much better what happens in open string theory and tachyon condensation, and we know now that this, at least in the context where it was argued, cannot happen. However, this uh, observation was, uh, has triggered, in fact, a long-term effort to parameterize Lorentz violation in quantum field theories, and some of it you already heard today. There were another series of investigations in the 90s that were described, in fact, uh, by uh, the morning speakers, who uh, used, in fact, uh, various ideas of quantum gravity and space-time phones, and their most solid outcome, in fact, were parameterizations of Lorentz violating respension relations, and most importantly, in fact, uh, the first serious comparisons, in fact, of such dispersion relations with data. It was around the same time noted in a completely uh, uh, different context that if one looks and probes deep brains uh, uh, in string theory, and in particular the velocity of light for uh, those who are sitting on them, uh, then that this can be variable. It can depend, in fact, on various background fields, and in particular, that it's smaller than the speed of light uh, in the bulk, and what affects it, in fact, is bulk gravitational fields. And because of this, it was suggested that this may solve, for example, the horizon problem in cosmology. Um, the setup was such that it was obvious that Lorentz violation in this context, in fact, would be generic in string theory and the antifolds could use precisely the brains as their um, ingredients, in fact, in order to construct um, matter or the standard model. And in particular, the natural conclusion of this idea was what uh, was called at the time Biraz cosmology, which is the cosmology of deep brains as they're moving, in fact, inside uh, a higher dimensional bulk. Around the same time also, there were varying uh, speed of light theories uh, that were constructed using brains. and uh, the way that this was done, in fact, would be to stabilize the position of brains in the bulk space uh, using ideas like what happens in the solar system 
and in particular, what would be pretty much the bulk would be uh, black brains. Uh, there was also a general uh, proof by Gibbons and uh, his student that in all such contexts, uh, the speed of light on the brains was always smaller than that of the bulk. Uh, more recently, in fact, a new twist was added to the story by Gubser, who has constructed, in fact, brain world solutions in which uh, you still have varying speed of light. However, unlike the previous examples that had black brains in the bulk, regular horizons, and therefore entropy, this was, in fact, a solution in which case the entropy was zero. Today, we understand such solutions, in fact, as they arise uh, in holographic backgrounds that describe uh, strongly coupled holographic systems at finite density, something also that, in a sense, explains in quote marks uh, the presence of Lorentz violation. There was an independent uh, development, as it was pointed out by Anselmi and his student, that if you strongly violate Lorentz invariance in the ultraviolet, uh, then you can allow, in fact, for a resolution of the hierarchy problem, and because in this way, in fact, you modify uh, severely, in fact, the power counting of interactions. And a related idea was soon described, uh, was applied by Hozawa in gravity, giving rise, in fact, to a, a non-relativistic, or at least non-Lorentz invariant, in quote marks again, a theory of gravity, which uh, was power counting renormalizable. Now, it is known, of course, by now that the original theory suffered from several issues that included strong coupling and other phenomenological problems. Um, there are today, in fact, models. Um, I think the most important one was um, presented by Blas Pujolas and Sibiryakov that, in fact, are phenomenologically uh, acceptable. Uh, however, it was interesting that in this class of theories, it was observed that they automatically solve several of the problems that inflation is supposed to solve, plus they produce uh, scale invariant or almost scale invariant perturbations. So let me come to a set of questions that I think are interested to pose, although they might not be the only ones. So, of course, my uh, starting um, premise is to investigate um, how and under what conditions and at what cost Lorentz invariance uh, can be violated. And the relevant questions are here. Uh, the first, of course, is the old question of uh, Nielsen and collaborators. Is Lorentz invariance an accident of low energy physics? And if it is, what is the dependence of the breaking scale with energy? A related question is under what conditions the breaking of Lorentz invariance is natural in the standard sense that we use this word in quantum field theory, and already Maxim in the morning, in fact, has given several contexts in which, in fact, this question can be uh, answered. Another question which was, of course, reason was raised, at least in a concrete way, by Kostelecki and Samuel, although to date, to my knowledge, there is no answer to that question is whether Lorentz invariance can be <coughs> dynamically spontaneously broken. Um, there is another issue, which is the general connection between Lorentz violation and dissipation in weakly coupled examples that we know uh, in several contexts. Of course, we know the presence of Cherenkov radiation, which uh, is, uh, in fact, a phenomenon of dissipation. But the question is, how general is uh, this connection? Another interesting question that was asked by Pierre Binotru in the morning, although in a slightly different form, uh, is how Lorentz violation is compatible with diffeomorphism invariance and gravity as we know it. And in particular, is gravity coupled to a Lorentz violating uh, quantum field theory a consistent theory? In general, I would say that one might think that Lorentz violation in quantum field theory and the issue of gravity seem to be two uh, completely decoupled subjects. However, as I will argue here, in fact, they're intimately related. So let me start with Lorentz violation in quantum field theory. We heard some of these things already in the morning. So the first thing would be to parameterize Lorentz violation in quantum field theory. This is a simple exercise. It essentially amounts to provide sources for all tensor operators that you have in the quantum field theory. I wrote here a few examples. 
vectors, potentials, uh, two tensors, three tensors, etc., and the coefficients, b mu, c mu, nu, d mu, nu, are, you can take them to be constant, typically that's the way it does, but you don't have to. Uh, if you take them to be generic, essentially this theory would break Lorentz invariance in the way uh, we understand it. For example, if you choose in this particular example b and d to be zero and c mu nu to be proportional to the Minkowski metric, then of course uh, your theory is Lorentz invariant. Now, you might also choose to take these uh, uh, parameters to be functions of the Feinstein point. In that case, of course, you break also translation invariance. You may choose, for example, this parameter to be this particular combination in terms of a new two tensor that we usually call metric. And then, of course, uh, this is the gravitational coupling as we understand it in this particular uh, context. And for example, if you turn on a non-trivial metric because of some other source that you have somewhere, what you're doing is also you're breaking Lorentz invariance, uh, albeit spontaneously. So the Lorentz violating uh, couplings essentially can be systematically parameterized using the previous idea. And already at this level, string theory suggests that the couplings of quantum field theory are the dynamical fields of the gravitational sector. In the example we have of the standard model, you have gauge of Yukawa couplings, and these are scalars. In fact, in concrete uh, realizations in different contexts, sometimes they can be moduli of your theory. Uh, the kinetic tensors, of course, essentially coupled to the what we usually call the space-time metric. You can have theta angles, for example, this is the instanton density, and then this viewed as a field is nothing else but what we usually call axions. And we have also chemical potentials, and these, if you go one step further, they're nothing more than what we usually call gravi-photons. And therefore, this suggests the rather general claim, which although it's motivated by string theory, I think it can be proven uh, entirely in quantum field theory, although I don't have yet all the uh, details. Um, and this is also what's suggested by the ADS-CFT correspondence, that gravity and string theory is essentially the dynamics of sources of quantum field theory. Indeed, this is explicitly realized in holography. And uh, in general, the uh, collection of this infinite number of sources for a quantum field theory essentially matches, in a sense, the many or infinite number of string states you have in a string theory. If this quantum field theory happens to be at large n, and you have some uh, semi-classical description, then the string theory would be semi-classical. If it's also strongly coupled, then as we understand already from controllable examples of the ADS-CFT correspondence, the string you will be making will be stiff. And you could very well approximate it for several purposes with a point particle theory that would be, of course, a gravitational theory, graviton plus other fields. So we also know that holography states that the effective action for the sources of a quantum field theory is essentially a gravity theory, but typically it's a gravity theory in higher dimensions. And in this language, if I go back now to my original point of start, which is uh, Lorentz violation, in this language, Lorentz violation is the existence of non-trivial tensor backgrounds in the gravitational sector, and that could be vectors to tensors or whatever not. And there are two ways, basically, that this type of Lorentz violation can appear in this context, and this is what I would call environmental Lorentz violation, so basically, because you have maybe some energy or charges, these generate gravitational other classical fields, and these classical fields break Lorentz invariance. Or what you could call dynamical Lorentz violation, and this is that the effective potential for these tensor operators in the quantum field theory has non-trivial minima, like happens with the Higgs potential, and these minima break dynamically uh, Lorentz invariance. Now, it is unlikely that this can happen at weak coupling. There are several arguments for this, but it might happen at strong coupling. As I mentioned before, I don't know of any, in fact, example where this happens, controllable example where this happens, but it might happen at strong coupling, and indeed, in this case, holography provides a formalism uh, to compute such uh, effective potentials. So 
Let me come now to the issue of coupling Lorentz violating quantum field theories uh, to gravity. Now, there is an obvious puzzle, in fact, and this puzzle generalizes to uh, similar statements you can make for many different kinds of symmetries. Now, let me illustrate the question. So, suppose you have a quantum field theory and a kind of, and a certain global symmetry that's broken or not present or whatever you want to call it. The question is, how can you couple it to a gauge theory where the symmetry is gauged? In fact, you should think that precisely this is the question we're uh, uh, asked to answer when we're talking about a Lorentz violating theory where Lorentz violation is not there, it's not a symmetry, it's broken. And we're coupling to a theory which is gravity, which in a sense is gauging translation and rotation invariance. Of course, this kind of question, it took, of course, several decades, but now we know what's the answer for other types of gauge symmetries, normal gauge symmetry for vectors or supersymmetry, local, in fact, supersymmetry. And in this case, in fact, the answer is that the only time that you have a consistent coupling of that sort is if the quantum field theory where you don't have that symmetry, somehow you don't have it because it has been broken either by sources, what I call environmental, or dynamically. So to put it different, basically what you have to do if you have a quantum field theory that's not invariant under the symmetry you're interested to couple to a gauge theory is that somehow you have to make your, the, the symmetry violating couplings transform under the symmetry so that the symmetry is formally restored. And then you can do the job. And let me give you a simple, albeit contrived example, that's the price for simplicity, how this would work. Suppose you're thinking about the U1 symmetry, and here is a scalar field psi, and I wrote a Lagrangian that obviously is not invariant under phase rotations of psi. So that's my symmetry, my theory that doesn't have U1 invariance, but I want to couple it, let's say, to a gauge theory, to, a, to electromagnetism. So what I would do, in a sense, would be to have the coupling transform in such a way that to make this invariant, and to eventually do this in a way which is doable, I will have, of course, to promote it to a field. I will write it in this suggestive way. The field is A here, and in fact, it's not very different from the usual axiom. And then, this is what this term would look like. I add my photon, and I add a Stuckeberg coupling involving this particular field, and now things work. This is the usual gauge transformation for the uh, gauge boson. The, this action field would have to shift, and of course, this transforms in the usual way so that everything, as you can see, is gauge invariant and now things work. So this very simple example, in fact, indicates how this is working in all possible cases and for any symmetry. So if you think then of gravity as the gauge theory of translations or light transformations or both, in fact, it depends on how you formulate uh, the theory, then it's obvious that this kind of um, intuition has to apply here. So to uh, couple a Lorentz violating theory consistently to gravity, Basically, this can be done if the breaking has to be of the type what I called spontaneous or environmental. And to translate this in plain words, basically what this says is that a Lorentz violating quantum field theory is a quantum field theory that's coupled to a generalized gravitational sector. It may have many tensor fields. I cannot specify how many there are. However, some of them will have to have non-trivial vacuum excitation values or classical uh, values. So that's basically the upshot. And therefore, in this language, the theory of fluctuating fields, which includes both the quantum field theory and the gravitational theory, is now fully diffeomorphism and Lorentz invariant. It's only the presence of backgrounds that breaks the Lorentz invariant. This goes back, in fact, to a question, an interesting question that was posed in the morning by Giovanni Amelino Camellia, which is to what extent, in fact, how do we change frames? And in fact, this answers uh, this question. Now, um, there is, however, an interesting point here that if the gravitational interaction, of course, in this context is diff invariant, uh, it's not of the Hozawa type. And we uh, already have mentioned both in the morning and I mentioned before that this is also one of the possibilities. So what happens? So let me discuss this uh, separate. So according to what I said so far, there's no place for Hozawa type or Hozawa Lipschitz gravity in this uh, context, in particular coupled to Lorentz violating uh, quantum field theories. That doesn't look reasonable. So let's see what happens here. And what happens is that in my previous formulation of the 
uh, statements. In fact, I had a hidden assumption that I didn't discuss it. And the hidden assumption is that the quantum field theory typically is defined in the usual way we define it as a perturbation of standard conformal field theory. If you wish, I organize the content of the theory by using uh, conformal invariance to, to organize operators and, uh, and, um, uh, um, uh, and in particular using representations of the standard Poincare group. However, this is not the only way to do it. Suppose that you have uh, a scaling quantum field theory that doesn't have the standard scale invariance, but it has a Lipschitz symmetry. And in fact, to remind you, those of you who don't remember what this is, it's a scale symmetry where, in fact, space scales, let's say, with a parameter lambda, but then time scales with a different power of lambda. And this power here, in fact, is typically called the dynamical exponent. And a free theory, in fact, that realizes this with z equals to 2 is this theory, where here, instead of having a box, which is the standard case, I have a box squared. So in this case, if instead I'm using such a theory and I'm asking what kind of gravity does it couple to consistently, then the answer, in fact, would be some sort of generalized hozawa lipschitz gravity. And there's a quick way, in fact, of seeing this is that if you consider such solutions, in fact, in holography, which realize such symmetries and you work out the normalization counter terms, eventually you get, instead of usual gravity, as is usually the case, you get Hozawa's Lipschitz gravity. So what this suggests, on the other hand, is that standard Hozawa Lipschitz gravity should be able to be written in terms of diffeomorphism of gra gravity coupled to more fields uh, which have non-trivial verbs. And indeed, we know that this is true. In fact, Hozawa gravity, you can add a scalar, and you can write it, in fact, as a diffeomorphism invariant theory. And of course, the usual frame in which we look at it is one where the scalar is a function of time, or it's used as time. So indeed, the two sort of descriptions eventually end up to the same thing. And uh, they are related by a basis rearrangement of operators and of the ultra symmetry. Let me down um, another point. Since I have such context to non of doing this, Okay, sorry about this. Um, and this function f, which usually it's called the blackness function, is a function which varies from some constant value, uh, which I called it like this here, down to zero. And this uh, quantity cuv is nothing else but the ultraviolet speed of light and also the speed of gravitons in the bulk. Now, suppose that I bed a d3 brain, or you can drop, in fact, a 3. It's a 3 brain at a fixed value of the radial coordinate that I called R star. And let me put something to sit on that brain, and I'll take a photon just to be simple, but you can put other things if you wish. And I will write the usual DBI action here, and it is indeed a determinant of an induced metric, that's the metric, the bulk metric, but as induced on the brain, and then I have a photon here. And for weak fields, I can even, in fact, expand it to look like electromagnetism. There should be a hat here. The induced metric is defined in the standard way. And then you can look at this action. You can calculate what's the effective speed of light, as seen by those who live on this brain. And indeed, you find that the speed of light square 
is precisely given by the blackness function evaluated at the position on the brain. And genetically, as I already argued before, here, in fact, this value is in general smaller than what I called the ultraviolet value of the velocity uh, of light. In particular, if you happen to put your brain close to the bulk horizon, which is the place where the blackness function vanishes, then indeed, in this case, the speed, the effective speed of light goes to zero. This is what we usually call the Carolian limit in honor of Louis uh, Carroll, where everything, in fact, in this limit, in fact, freezes. Now, you can consider more complicated embeddings and start looking at much more difficult situations. You can have, for example, brains that move with some velocity in internal dimensions, or they can be stretching around the radial direction. And in this case, of course, you will find similar things, that you have effective speeds of lights that vary with many of the fields that appear in the bulk, or with what they do, the velocity. This is a simple formula, in fact, in this case, uh, in which case you have an extra velocity for this brain, and then the effective speed of light also depends on the velocity of this brain in the extra uh, directions. And in this particular case, also, in fact, a horizon develops on this uh, brain world precisely at the place where this becomes uh, zero, although uh, the horizon in the bulk is somewhere else. So, in particular, the speed of light here is position dependence, breaks Lorentz invariance, and this is precisely the context that was described by uh, Magueo in, in, in the morning. And now I'd like to come to the holographic dual point of view of this construction that I described uh, here. Now, the previous setup, according to the standard roots of holography, corresponds to having first a theory that I call theta, and this is a holographic large n theory. It's a strongly coupled holographic large n theory. And this is a theory that's responsible, in fact, for generating the bulk black brain metric that I showed you before. This theory now is coupled, coupled to a weakly coupled theory that I call theta prime, and this is essentially the theory on the brain, Maxwell theory in the particular example that I showed you. Now, according again to the startup looks, to rules, if I look at the bulk gravity solution, when the radial coordinate goes to infinity in the coordinates I presented you the metric, that corresponds to the presence of the boundary in the space, and this is the ultraviolet, in fact, of the dual large and quantum field theory, the presence of the blackness factor in the metric implies that the dual quantum field theory theta has a non-trivial uniform energy density, uh, um, uh, which is, of course, uh, everywhere in space, and the presence of the bulk horizon implies that this particular state of constant density is thermal. And, of course, not surprisingly, it is the presence of this constant uh, density in the dual theory that triggers, of course, the uh, Lorentz violation. Now, if we look at the bare action of the theta prime theory, which is the theory of the brain, this, according to the same rules, corresponds to the brain being placed, in fact, at the ultraviolet boundary of the geometry, which corresponds to R going to infinity. And as it is usual in holography, the radial scale in this context corresponds to the normalization group scale of the dual theory. And with the coordinate I'm used, R, in fact, is uh, essentially proportional to what you would call the energy of the quantum field theory. Now, the used action of the brain, when you placed it in an intermediate radial position, R star, corresponds essentially to the effective action of the weakly coupled theory theta prime at that particular uh, at that particular um, uh, energy, and, um, uh, and, uh, uh, but only after you integrate out the quantum corrections of the theory, uh, the other theory, theta. And therefore, you can view the formula that I showed you before of, in terms of the effective speed of light as essentially a formula that's telling you what is, in fact, the dependence of the effective uh, speed of light after you've done the quantum corrections and you've obtained, in fact, an energy dependence. There are other sources for, um, um, for Lorentz violations, such metrics. I will not go through. I'm already uh, almost out of time. Uh, there is one case which is interesting, which is the case of elliptic symmetry that I added before. And this is, in fact, the difference in this case. And that corresponds to metrics of that sort. The difference is that here, in fact, you have blackness functions 
uh, which have no entropy and no regular horizons. And in this case, if you work out what is the effective speed of light, in fact, it goes that energy to the dynamical exponent minus one, which is something that you should have expected, in fact, on uh, dimensional uh, grounds. And you should observe that since zeta is always bigger or equal to one, that typically this becomes infinite at high energy and it vanishes at low energy. Obviously, I have to skip this, but this is a very interesting issue because I think, although I don't have a very general proof of this, I think that in all cases that we know of, but now also in more general cases that go beyond weak coupling, uh, Lorentz violation, uh, it always comes together with some sort of uh, uh, dispersion or energy loss. And indeed, in fact, you can see also in contexts like this, at strong coupling that this happens. So let me, in fact, go directly to the outlook. What I argued is that Lorentz violation in quantum field theory is intimately connected to gravity, or generalized gravity, I should say. Um, the scaling symmetries of the quantum field theory decide the type of gravity theory that is relevant. All the Lorentz violating protocols can therefore be generated by non-trivial background fields, and that includes not only the metric, but many other fields that in principle your gravitational theory may have. Um, probe brains on such background fields are model uh, Lorentz violating quantum field theories, and sometimes, in fact, they have a dual holographic interpretation as weakly coupled quantum field theories in interaction with a large end sector that blinks Lorentz invariance. Um, I didn't have time to go through this, but Cherenkov energy loss is generic and has analogs at strong coupling that can be calculated. And I left open already a very interesting, at least for me, question to what extent spontaneous Lorentz violation is possible in quantum field theory. Thank you. Um, so is there any way using this, you know, black brain function to stabilize the speed of light? Sure. Like some kind of virilization? In fact, so. that's what already was done at the time through somebody you know, but also Stephon by Lewis. other people in the brain, Stefan, yeah. that you can, you can make planetary systems. There may be other ways, but this but is the simpler one. How do you, how do you, so it's basically virilization, what you need to do. You need to virilize the system, make it circular, blah, blah, blah. But is this, can you actually get experimental constraints on variations you might see nowadays? In fact, uh, there have been, uh, more concrete models of the type worked out later by mm -hmm. Germani and Kehayas. And these guys, in fact, these, they put mm -hmm. them together with constraints that come from, let's say, inflationary data. Now, I cannot make a claim in detail, but it seems that they could get most of the features right. However, I cannot give you a detailed answer in this. But they, they sort of looked at precisely such uh, planetary systems because this is in fact, a, a model of a, what you could call a recurring universe, something that goes back and forth and in fact contracts and, and expands. Uh, there is not, nothing, something obviously wrong, but I don't know if all the details have been. Uh, so just an, a comment about the fact that you can always view these things as spontaneously broken with fields. You always find these violations of energy conservation, which obviously from this point of view means you're transferring, you'd be transferring the energy to these extra fields. In other you words, if you, if, you, if you just say, I broke diffeomorphism invariance, therefore I don't have conservation of stress energy. Well, then if you say, no, actually I only broke it spontaneously because actually I have a dynamical field there, then effectively what you're doing is, is basically finding a reservoir which is taking all these energy violations into it. Uh, that uh, may be a way of saying it, but I'd like to, to put it in a different way because this is in fact a very interesting uh, point. Uh, we should remember two things, and there are several other things, in fact, in that direction which are interesting, but uh, I haven't discussed them. That in quantum field theory, if we have translation variance, energy is conserved. In gravity, it is not. In fact, energy is always zero, whatever you do. And this is, I think, important because the analog of what you call energy conservation in gravity is consistency of your gravitational equations. That's how we derive yeah, it. I didn't mean the Hamiltonian constraint. I mean stress energy tensor conservation. Yeah, this is a consistency of the equations, and in fact, this is precisely equivalent to what I call consistently of coupling gravity with these theories. So it is the same. Other questions? Yeah. So when you say that Cherenkov energy loss is generic, do you mean necessary? Or uh, do you mean as, as I mentioned, you I cannot prove models? it in general, but it seems that wherever you look, even in 
let's say, exotic cases like the ones I didn't have time, unfortunately, to describe in strongly coupled systems, uh, it seems to always be there. What changes, in fact, how it depends on the particular interactions. But it, in fact, it is precisely interesting that at least in strongly coupled systems uh, and this particular ways of energy loss, you can see that it only happens when you violate Lorentz invariance. That's, I find, interesting, but as I said, I don't have a general proof. Other questions, comments? Uh, well, actually, uh, your last point there, so you, by spontaneous uh, Lorentz variation, you mean uh, uh, broken by the vacuum? In a sense, yeah, you have an effective potential for a vector, and you find out that this effective potential has sure. a minimum, which is at non-zero values for the vector. So a, an example of this would be uh, the Gauss condensate, for instance, right? Uh, but this is in the context of a gravitational theory. So it's something that no. it's, oh. in a, it's in a, you see, it's, in fact, this is another interesting point which comes up precisely because of this question, which is how do you separate the gravitational sector from what we call usually quantum field theory? And this uh, question, if you think a little bit about it, you'll see that in general you can't. It's only in regimes that you can call that this belongs to gravity and this belongs to quantum field theory. I have, of course, a good example in my mind which I cannot claim it general, which is string theory. In string theory, roughly speaking, what we usually call quantum field theory is basically uh, open strings because their low energy, in fact, is including the fields that we usually use quantum field theory. And then closed strings is what we would call the gravitational sector. But we know also from this case that depending on which regime you're looking at, in fact, these two can get mixed. So from this point of view and the way, in fact, we're using the Gauss condensate, this belongs to the gravitational sector, and it's interesting maybe to discuss later to what extent you can put something like this in what I would call quantum field theory with the user rules that we're using in quantization and consider this as Lorentz violation, but it's obviously something we should discuss afterwards. So if there are no, no any other comments or questions, we go to the coffee break and we'll be back in half an hour. <laughs>